paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Defiance about the OTO, Peter. Sure. The OTO, okay, the letters OTO stand for Ordo Templi Orientis, Order of the Temple of the East. And the idea was that the OTO was a Knights Templar organization, uh, that it had its roots ideologically, if not historically, with the Knights Templar. Um, why the Knights Templar? The interpretation, and this was a German group around the turn of the century. These Germans got together and said, we're going to create this sort of quasi-Masonic order, not affiliated with Freemasonry, but these were former Masons, you know, current Masons, people who had flirtations with Freemasonry. They formed a magical society, a secret society that had Masonic rituals of initiation, but at the heart of all of this was a sexual secret. They believed that sex magic was the the core of all magic, the core of all occult principles had to do with sexuality. And they got this from an American uh, called P.B. Randolph. Now, Mr. Randolph was a was part uh, African-American, part white. He was born free, not a slave. He was born in the North. Uh, this is the time of the Civil War around that, that era. And uh, he became fascinated with occultism, Rosicrucianism, mysticism, he claimed to have been gone to the Middle East to have studied with uh, Arab uh, teachers and all the rest of it, just the way the stories were about the Knights Templar, and came back to through Europe, where he was kind of well known for a while, and then in the United States, where he started doing Rosicrucian meetings and and sort of seances and things like that. But his his claim to fame was really the books that he was writing on what he believed were the sexual secrets behind all of creation. Uh, Randolph was a very conservative individual. He uh, was supposedly he was a friend of Abraham Lincoln, was involved in uh, some slave operations, some slave activities during and after the Civil War. So he was very committed politically and also was very conservative. Morally, he seemed to have been an extremely conservative person. He wasn't an advocate for free sex of any kind. But he was saying that within sexuality, there's tremendous occult power, and you have to learn how to control it and how to um, focus it towards the, the end results that you desire to achieve. And this, this entire philosophy became embedded within the OTO, the German group. Eventually, Aleister Crowley joined the German OTO, and they named him the head of the OTO in Great Britain, Ireland, and all the English-speaking countries. So he became their leader, and he chose the name Baphomet, which we came across earlier as the name of the deity supposedly worshipped by the Knights Templar, for which they were proscribed and condemned and arrested and all the rest of it. So he took that name very consciously, very deliberately, uh, identifying himself with the god of the, of the Templars. So the OTO started that way. Uh, Crowley then broke off from the German version of the OTO, created basically his own type of OTO, rewrote all the rituals, uh, and put the sexual element very sort of front and center in the OTO. So that by the time you're getting to the higher degrees, specifically the seventh and mostly the eighth and ninth degrees, you then become aware of the sexual secrets and how to use sexuality in a magical context. And that's really the whole thing of the OTO. Uh, is that eighth and ninth degree uh, message. Now, there are initiation rituals for the first few degrees, and they involve Saladin. They involve you know, the leader of the, of the uh, uh, Arab and Muslim armies that had taken over Jerusalem who were fighting with the Knights Templar. They were in these relationships with the Templars. So um, there, were, there was uh, you know, a heavy Knights Templar aspect, and somehow it got mixed in with the sexuality. And so the initial degrees bring you up to a certain point 
But then when you get to the eighth degree, um, there are no rituals for that. It's strictly an instruction concept where they either think that you already know what the, the secret is or they, they give you a few hints and you're the eighth degree and then you're the ninth degree. So that's today's OTO. It started with the Germans based on Randolph's writings, based on some kind of very heavy furniture sort of Masonic rituals, and later got a bit more streamlined with Crowley and became oriented strictly towards the so-called sexual secret that's behind all of magic, alchemy, and everything else, according to the OTO. Well, Crowley kind of definitely took it over. And then sure. the philosophy well, became the OTO philosophy. Yeah. Well, he, he created his own system called Thelema. Uh, in 1904, he had this uh, revelation in Egypt. He wrote down the way Joseph Smith would write his, his famous Book of Mormon. Uh, thankfully, the uh, Book of the Law in uh, Crowley's writing is very, very short. It's only three chapters, and it's very small. But this is the statement of his philosophy, which can be summed up in the phrase, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law to which you normally respond, love is the law, love under will. So that's the, the, in a nutshell, the philosophy of Thelema, which is the philosophy of the OTO and of Crowley in his writings generally. So he created a new religion. He claimed this was the new age, the new aeon, replacing all the old religion uh, concepts, all the old theologies, all the old rituals, everything was going to be jettisoned in favor of this new religion that he had founded on the basis of this contact with an non-terrestrial or a non-human source called Iwas, uh, which was the spirit that was talking to him. So it's, I mean, it's, it's too much to put into a very short podcast. There's a lot to it, but basically this is, this is the idea. So Crowley created his own faith, his own religion, and used the OTO as his vehicle for it. Now, there were OTOs that were not uh, under Crowley's leadership that broke away and eventually formed other groups. There was the Brotherhood of Saturn, which formed in Germany, which uh, was not a Thelemic group to begin with. Uh, there are other different offshoots of the OTO in different areas. But um, for the most part today, the OTO is the Crowley organization that we know, and it's mostly the organization run out of the United States. For some reason, the OTO doesn't look upon you as favorable. No, I mean... <clears throat> I had a problem with them. Yeah, I had a problem with them back in the in the seventies. Um, there was a point at which there was an occult renaissance taking place in New York City, and it was all very um, diverse, embracing of everyone and everything. So we had Tolkien people. You know, we had uh, people who were involved with the uh, Society for Creative Anachronism, right? The Renaissance Fair people. You know, they were involved. We had people from every walk of life. We had Hindus, we had Buddhists, we had people doing tantric yoga. We had everybody all in one one big happy family. Even uh, the, the local Church of Satan chapter, which was another, was kind of a joke also. So everybody was involved, the Wiccans, the witchcraft people. Everybody was involved in basically a general movement, which was, we were just coming out of the Vietnam War. We were just coming out of a period where there was a struggle between the left and the right, between the hippies and the, the peace nicks and the, the people escaping the draft on the one hand and the very right wing sort of 1950s gray flannel suit, suit people on the other. So we were coming out of this, we're trying to build this coalition, this coalescence of people. And Crowley was an important idea that you do what you do without wilt, right? You have the right to do what you wanna do. You can't be told what to do. This was, a, this was very attractive. And a lot of people said, okay, I might be a Wiccan. I might be a Buddhist, I might be, but I can kind of go along with this. I can sign on to it. Well, the OTO then, at that time, which was fragmentary, it was in pieces, started to group itself together and looked at what was happening and said, we have to do something about this. We have to control the situation, right? And once they started thinking that, then the whole thing kind of fell apart. And that then I, I was, I said, no, we're not going to have this. I'm not going to be part of something like this. You guys are nuts. You're becoming kind of fascist and this is not a good look. And uh, so I broke away from them. I, I cut my relationships with them. A lot of other people did as well. The OTO did become kind of right wing. I mean, they were being led by a guy called Grady McMurtry, who had been an officer during World War II and in Korea. Uh, so he was a military guy. And uh, he 
there's a long story with him and the FBI and the boy in the box affair in California. There's a whole other story. I, I, I want to touch on that. So yeah, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. But anyway, so here was this guy and he was at, at one point while I was still talking to them, uh, the rumor went around that he was initiating skinheads, you know, uh, at a bar into the OTO. And I'm like, okay, this is getting, this is getting stupid. You know, this is not what we were looking for. We were more like the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper album, People We Like. That was our idea of the OTO. It wasn't this sort of regimented thing where we're going to control the Crowley copyrights and you can't publish anything by, about Crowley unless you get our permission and all that. It just got stupid. It got really stupid and really legalistic and and all of that. And uh, we have friends in the OTO. You knew people that I know. Uh, you knew James Wasserman as an example. And, you know, Wasserman became very right wing. I mean, he did. He had his photograph taken with uh, Roger Stone a few years before he died, uh, Wasserman. So, I mean, it's like, you know, and with guns and everything, and he's very pro-Trump and very Tea Party, anti-Obama and all the rest of it. And he kind of made the assumption that if you were really a felon, like that's what you would do too. So there was this kind of strong um, right wing element that was going through the OTO. And that became even more worrisome uh, to a lot of people. So there's this, this idea where Lavenda is like an enemy of the OTO and he talks bad about the OTO and therefore you cannot deal with him. And they told Wasserman bluntly, have nothing to do with him. And Wasserman to his credit said, look, I've known this guy since the seventies. I mean, you know, we go back, we we know everybody in common and he's not evil. He's not, you know, fomenting hatred or discord. He just doesn't like you guys. <laughs> so that's, what, what, you know, what do you want? But they they warned him not to. And, you know, he just kind of ignored them. Um, and he tried to get me to join again. You know, he gave it his best shot. But uh, I'm not a joiner, I guess. So missed the boat. Knew, uh, Jim Wasserman, he wasn't particularly fond of me. Um, so I can't repeat claimed that we had a friendship. We did know each other. So do without wilt, which is the foundation of the OTO, that gives a tremendous amount of latitude for, for scrupulous and unscrupulous behavior. Well, if you translate it as do what you want, yeah, absolutely. But it's not supposed to be understood that way. And that's what a lot of people get wrong. Even people who've been in the OTO for years can't quite separate out the do what thou wilt part from the do what you want part. These are two different ideas, two different concepts. Crowley tried to make that clear um, numerous times that the, you can't do what thou wilt until you know what your will is. So you first have to find your will. You have to find out who you really are. And once you find out who you really are, then you pretty much have to do what thou wilt, because at that point to go against it is basically to commit suicide. So you have to do what you will, but you have to find out who that is first. And that's the whole process of initiation that Crowley goes on about. I mean, there's degrees without number. Well, there's numbers, but there's, you know, the OTO degrees, that's one set. There's the, the Silver Star organization that he founded, the AA, uh, which has a, a set of degrees also, which is a sort of a self-initiatory path. Um, but the whole point of all of this is not is not suddenly, okay, you're in the OTO, now you can do whatever you want. That was never the case. You know, you have to find out who you are first. Most of us don't have a clue. So the idea is to go along a certain path, test yourself psychologically, test yourself emotionally, go through these magical practices, which test different aspects of your personality, and eventually figure out who you are. And part of the process is something called knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel a concept that was taken from a grimoire called the Book of Sacred Magic of Abramelin, the mage, long story. Anyway, the idea was you you find your holy guardian angel, your, you could say it's your super self, and with that contact, you begin to slowly understand who you are, and you understand what your will is. Um, that's putting it you know, really a watered-down version of it, but that's basically what it is. This is an old concept, though. Crowley didn't come up with it. This is something you'll find in some very, very old books on mysticism. You'll find it on some Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophy as well, some Arab mysticism. Uh, the idea that there is a self that kind of looks like you, that has that's part of you in some way, but is a superior version. It's um, you're looking at yourself, you're standing outside of yourself, and you're having this conversation. So um, it, it goes back very, very far. 
But the idea is you have to do that first. And that's just too much work for most people. So they'll settle for do what thou want, shall be the whole of the law, instead of do what thou wilt. Now, there were some uh, rather interesting manifestations of the OTO in California. Yep. And, uh, the Solar Lodge uh, was raided. It was in Riverside County, and it was raided um, by the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. And they found a six-year-old kid basically in a box, and he was chained in this box. And, and this was, and the OTO Solar Lodge, it was a, a definite part of the OTO. I mean, the OTO has tried to distance itself from the Solar Lodge, but the Solar Lodge was, from what I understand, an OTO branch in good standing. Well, this was in the 1960s when there really wasn't an active OTO presence anymore. Um, the, the lodge in uh, Pasadena that was run by Jack Parsons uh, kind of fell apart after Parsons died in 1952. And there wasn't much of a presence anymore. The, the, there were a couple of very strong OTO members who were still out there, but they were not really running uh, an actual operational lodge. Crowley had, had died in 1947. Uh, the OTO had been taken over by a German called Karl Germer, uh, who was sort of a secretary, sort of organization guy, not really an initiation guy. Um, and he didn't really take care of the order at all. And then he died. Uh, and then the whole thing fell into to a mess. So there were some OTO people in California who kind of gave this woman called Jean Brayton um, the permission to kind of run an OTO lodge. What the OTO says is that these these this couple in California did not have permission to do this. They didn't have the authority to do it. They did it on their own. Therefore, this lodge was not real. It was not a genuine lodge, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of legalistic wrangling over whether or not this was really genuinely an OTO operation. The thing is, in the 1960s, there weren't any. I mean, anywhere in the world, really. There was Kenneth Grant's operation in England. Uh, and then Germer was kicking him out of the OTO because he didn't like where, what Grant was doing. Grant was friendly with people that Gurman didn't like. So there are all these personalities and there's this, this politics and everything else. There was no OTO. I mean, let's face it, there really wasn't. And then Grady McMurtry then gets on the scene and he goes down and decides he's gonna go and figure out what's going on and settle everything. So he goes to California. And I have the, 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 the records of FBI interviews with Grady McMurtry. So you could say that Grady was trying to walk a, a thin line here. He was definitely going after the Solar Lodge and saying, no, these guys are, are no good. Um, you know, and he was trying to give the FBI enough information that they could just, you know, forget about this, close it down and not associate it with the OTO. So McMurtry was doing what he could to kind of separate all the pieces out. Uh, it's an interesting bunch of conversations, um, which kind of makes, makes Grady McMurtry look like a narc a little bit, you know, like he's cooperating with the feds a little bit too enthusiastically. But he was a military guy. You know, he was very much a military background. He sort of gloried in that in his later years. So I could see where that would appeal to him. But the boy in the box affair exploded ideas about the OTO everywhere because there were little groups in, in Los Angeles and San Francisco who were doing philemic things. And this revelation uh, of the boy in the box kind of made everybody nervous and everybody sort of hit the deck after that. They were all sort of, oh God, now where is this going to happen? You know, where, is, where is this going to lead? McMurtry, to his credit, then kind of pulled the OTO together in various pieces of it. He got everything kind of set up and working uh, legitimately, but then he died. And when he died, then the new group took over. And the people who took over, this is probably getting into the weeds and probably a lot of your listeners don't care. But the people who wound up taking over the OTO really did not have all the initiations. They had basically battlefield commissions uh, to be ninth degrees, which is the highest regular degree in the OTO. And they had not actually gone through all the stages, gone through all the various intermediate degrees. So they were sort of thrown into this situ situation where they're going to control and run the OTO. And the first thing they wanted to do, of course, was to control the copyrights. Crowley died in 1947. A lot of his books were printed without being copywritten. Some were written, you know, like the Book of the Law in 1904. That should be in public domain by now. 
um, and a lot of other things like that. But they fought in the United States to control it as part of their property. And, you know, it made no sense to me. And I oppose that, which is another reason why I'm considered persona non grata. I totally opposed any idea that they're going to control the copyrights of OTO material. It makes no sense. If you really want to promote Thalema and you want to promote Crowley, the books that are already out there in print, let them run, right? This is this is free advertising for you guys. You guys are not involved in it. But they wanted to control it. They wanted to decide who publishes it. They wanted, of course, a piece of the action. And all of this, you know, it got messed up. And the whole thing became very political and very sort of greedy and stupid and very Catholic church. And that's why I said, no, I don't think we need this. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing to be persona non grata from the OTO. <laughs> Now, speaking of the OTO in California, let's talk about Jack Parsons. Great, great, great character. I mean, this is the, this is the, the thing that the OTO itself today has the hardest time with, because if anybody is just great advertising for the OTO, you would think it would be Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was this genius rocket scientist, literally a rocket scientist. Here's a guy who had no big formal education, really. He didn't have a PhD in, in physics or chemistry or avionics, for that matter, or anything like that. But he loved blowing stuff up, right? And he knew how to blow stuff up probably better than anybody else. And he got together with a group of his friends who were all like students at the local university, and they all get together and blow stuff up. And this is in the 1930s, and he's in, in correspondence with Werner von Braun, back in Germany, because they're all rocket aficionados. They all want to go and, and build rockets and go to the moon and do all this great stuff. So they're in communication. I mean, Parsons was just a, a ball of energy when it came to rocket science. And he inherited some money. He had a house in Pasadena. And he rented out rooms or basically gave rooms to people passing through, mostly science fiction writers. But he also was very um, uh, inspired by what he read about Aleister Crowley. He thought that this kind of religion was really right up his alley. He didn't like Christianity. He didn't like any of the, the standard, you know, mainstream religions. None of that turned him on. But this whole do what thou wilt thing was right up exactly what he wanted. And it was mystical and it was magic and it was planets and it was, you know, initiations and expanding consciousness and all of this stuff. And he loved that shit. He just totally loved it. So he became very enthusiastic. He joined the local OTO lodge. And uh, he, he made his premises basically open to the OTO if they wanted to use it for rituals and stuff. And one thing led to another, and he became the head of the OTO Lodge in California. And he also founded, basically he founded what would be, what would become NASA or... Well, the Jet Propulsion Lab. He was one of the founders of JPL. In and fact, he was so identified with JPL, they used to call it the Jack Parsons Laboratory, right? I mean, he was the guy. And I believe that there were three other OTO members uh, working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I don't know about that. I know Parsons was, obviously. Um, he had a number of other associates who were kind of, you know, hangers on. Whether they were actually officially members of the order or not, I don't know. I don't think so. I think Parsons is the only one we know for sure. But he then, because he, you know, he, Ray Bradbury met him, right? I mean, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, I mean, Heinlein, these, these guys came in and out of his circle because this is where the the the, the science fiction guys used to hang out uh, close enough to Hollywood that they could, you know, go back and forth for that reason as well. And one of the science fiction authors who showed up was a guy called Hubbard, and this was L. Ron Hubbard. Now, Parsons is involved in the war effort during World War II. He's deeply involved. They're coming up with solid fuel and liquid fuel, you know, alternatives. They're having a hard time storing fuel on, on, on ships for missiles and everything else. Parsons is embedded. He's deep into all of this stuff. And he's working with a guy called Theodore von Karman. And Theodore von Karman is one of the most famous names in aerospace history in the United States. You don't hear much of his name very much anymore, but he was critical. We have something called the von Karman line, which separates our atmosphere from space, for instance. We have von Karman uh, equations for all sorts of other things. He was the first guy to win a National Science Award medal given to him by Jack Kennedy when Kennedy was president. So this is this is a deep guy, right? And Parsons is one of his his uh, ingenues, right? So von Karman has 
Jack Parsons over here. He has a Chinese guy called Tian, Tian Suesun over here. He's got Frank Molina. He's got a whole bunch of other people that he's working with. All became very famous in the Czech Propulsion Lab days. So all of this is going on. World War II is coming to an end. And one naval officer shows up, L. Ron Hubbard. Now, he did not cover himself with glory in World War II. He was in the Navy. He was sort of off the coast of California. And he started shelling an island for no particular reason from his ship. He just, I guess, thought it would be fun. He was a guy who believed that there were Nazis everywhere. They were constantly chasing him. He was writing letters to the government all the time. He obviously had a screw loose. And he was suffering from ulcers. That was the excuse. So he was kind of discharged from the Navy eventually. He had been in hospital for a while. They hospitalized him because they thought he was nuts. And then he befriended Jack he was Parsons. He was and then this whole thing becomes, yeah, this whole thing becomes really weird. Parsons and Hubbard really get together. They bond completely. Hubbard is learning whatever he can from Parsons about magic. Hubbard had never heard of Aleister Crowley. He's loving all this stuff. And they conduct rituals out in the Mojave Desert, you know, to invoke um, a goddess, basically, to invoke to invoke a, a famous spiritual force called Babylon. And they're trying to invoke, you know, they're trying to come up with a girlfriend, basically, for, for Jack Parsons. And he's pretty much created what she should look like in his mind. And they're doing these rituals because what's happening, Hubbard is stealing his other girlfriend. So... Parsons has to go out there and create his own and basically is successful. Marjorie Cameron shows up waiting for him when he comes back from the desert and then the rest is history. And didn't uh, L. Ron Hubbard steal some finances from? Just, just getting there, sure. Hubbard and Parsons got together and formed a company. They were going to buy yachts on the West Coast and sail them to the East Coast to sell, you know, luxury vessels. Parsons put in virtually all of the money. Hubbard put in a couple hundred dollars, I think less than a thousand dollars. Then suddenly Hubbard disappears. He disappears with all the money. And his girlfriend. And his girlfriend. Hubbard is actually already married. He marries bigamously Parsons' girlfriend. So now he's got two wives. He's in he's in Miami. Uh, Parsons realizes that he's been, you know, he's been hoaxed. He runs out to Miami, and according to the story, he conjures the spirit of Mars, creates a kind of storm over the ocean in Miami, and forces the ship back so that the feds can arrest Hubbard and seize the boat, and he can recoup some of his money, Parsons. Um, that's the beginning of Hubbard's associations with the feds, and it's going to go on the rest of his life. But that was the start of it, and the finding out that he was a bigamist and all the rest of it. And didn't... Uh... Parsons blew himself up shortly thereafter, I believe. Well, Parsons had also a rough time with the feds because although Parsons was crucial to the war effort, although he helped to found the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, although he did all of this stuff under the tutelage of Theodore von Karman, all of this was not enough to save him when Operation Paperclip went into effect. But we brought the Nazi scientists over and we suddenly the whole country went anti-communist crazy they believed that, you know, Parsons and everybody else, they were all communists, and we couldn't trust any of them. The actual native-born Americans who created the JPL were suddenly all suspect of being communist and anti-American. So Parsons lost his security clearance twice in, during his life. He started working for the Hughes organization, which is very interesting. Uh, but then because he lost his security clearance, he lost his job at Hughes. And then von Karman was trying to get him a job with the Israelis. Israel was just being founded, and they needed rocket scientists because the Egyptians were building rockets to attack them. And Parsons was going to go over there and help out in Israel. That wasn't working out. He decides he's going to go to Mexico with, with his girlfriend, with Carmen, with uh, uh, Marjorie Cameron. And as he's cleaning out his, his premises there in Pasadena, and they're packing up to leave, he has one more order of explosives because he was selling explosives on the side, kind of a side gig. And according to the story, he dropped a vial of fulminate of mercury and blew himself to smithereens. That was in 1952, um, I think May of 52. So the whole career of Jack Parsons came to this end. And then his mother found out and committed suicide. 
immediately, I think the same day. So it was a very tragic uh, situation. And there's actually a crater on the moon. Yeah. After, yeah. Named after Jack Parsons. And at one point, Werner von Braun said the real the real hero of the space of the space program in the United States was Jack Parsons. I mean, and Werner von Braun is one of the Nazi scientists that we brought over from Paperclip for people that right. don't recognize his name. And he was ultimately a fountainhead for NASA and the Apollo space program. So now we have Scientology. We have L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. And a lot of Scientology, from what I understand, has been purloined from the OTO. Oh, well, from Crowley in general. Yes. If you have copies of the early lectures that L. Ron Hubbard gave in the pre-Scientology days when he was doing Dianetics, which was his, uh, his philosophy was Dianetics, he lost that, and it's a long story, but he was running Dianetics, and he would have these speeches, he would have these, these, these sessions, and you can get prints, you can get uh, printouts of these things, and he keeps talking about how he and Aleister Crowley were great friends and great buddies, you know, <laughs> and that he learned everything that he did, you know, about this from Aleister Crowley, opened his mind and everything. The problem is Crowley died in 1947. There was yes. no way that Hubbard had ever met Aleister Crowley. Jack Parsons never met Aleister Crowley. So there's no way that Hubbard did, right? But anyway, he would promote this story for a while um, until after Dianetics, then he changed all that. He dropped the whole Crowley stuff because he began to realize the whole Crowley thing was maybe look a little skeezy, a little sleazy, and maybe it wouldn't be a good look for, for Hubbard and Scientology, as if that would matter at this point. Um, then he started creating this new concept. He took Dianetics to another level. And just like Joseph Smith and, and the Mormons, the Mormons believe one of the secret teachings, or it's no longer secret, is that when you reach a certain stage in this world, in life, if you're a perfect Mormon, when you die, you don't really die. You go into the into the heavens and you get your own planet, right? That's always and, a seductive thing. Yeah, your, your own planet. I mean, damn, why not? It's, well, uh, Hubbard's operation was kind of similar, right? Yes. Uh, the the higher degrees of Scientology, you learn about Zeno, and you learn about you know. Uh, alien beings coming down to earth and populating the planet and yeah just weird stuff so he went off in that direction just like just like uh joseph smith they they really have a lot in common between hubbard and smith um but like we don't have to go into that right now but it was a lot of a lot of crossover between the two especially where magic is concerned because it was magic that brought parsons into thalema into alistair crowley and the oto and it was magic that uh, gave hubbard his background in Dianetics, that he was able to formulate an entire theory. And then Scientology suddenly gives birth to a, a very nasty organization called the Process Church. Yeah. Let's talk about the Process Church and Marianne McLean. Yeah, Marianne McLean and Robert de Grimston, they, these are two, two people, two Brits. I mean, de Grimston was born in Shanghai, for what that's worth. Marianne McLean was was born in in, uh, in the UK. They were both members of Scientology uh, at the Mayfair operation, which is the earliest uh, one of the earliest Scientology operations uh, outside of the United States and in, in England. And they were, you know, they were doing the the auditing and everything else there they were supposed to do. They met and decided to break off and form their own group. This was in 1963. They decided they wanted to form their own kind of super Scientology organization. But they were bringing in elements of religion into it. Scientology was kind of, it was called the Church of Scientology for tax reasons more than anything else. Uh, it wasn't really a religion the way we would understand it, I suppose. I guess that's a question for religious scholars to fight over. Um, it's not worth in this discussion, but it was. it's kind of a, a very debatable point. But they wanted to do something, Robert de Grimston and Marianne McLean, to form a kind of super Scientology that would use religious iconography, religious ritual dress and everything else to create a movement that would be more attractive uh, to the non-nerds out there, to the people who are looking for an alternative to Christianity. And their idea was to combine uh, Satan and Lucifer and Jehovah sort of all in one package, that you could worship any three of them or any one of them or all three or however you want to do it. And they broke it into different groups within within something called the Process Church of the Final Judgment. 
They didn't really call it that in the beginning. That name they didn't really have until they um, incorporated in the state of Louisiana. They incorporated in New Orleans. They were looking for an incorporation and they were looking for a name. They didn't have a name. And uh, they went to a lawyer called Tommy Baumler. And Tommy Baumler said, how about the satanic something? And they didn't like that. How about this? How about that? Eventually came up with the process church of the final judgment. And that's the name they all agreed on. And that's what they incorporated as Tommy Jew Baumler. However, that lawyer was one of the lawyers who worked for Guy Bannister. He was one of the law people who worked there along with people like David Ferry and Jack Martin and essentially Lee Harvey Oswald. They it's all worked out of that building. Yeah, that was that was the, the dream team there. And Baumler was one of the people involved with Guy Bannister. He was he was part of that thing. He was uh, um, he, he questioned by the garrison probe. And I mean, Baumler was a famous guy in New Orleans. He was one of the lawyers you went to. And to have to run, I ran, I ran across that information just a couple of years ago because uh, Thomas Wiley published his book on the process. He was a member, a long term member of the process. And he talks about Baumler. I'm thinking, how come nobody's picked this up? This is Tommy Baumler, the, the JFK probe. And, you know, Jim Garrison, nobody's picked this up. This is the guy who incorporated the Process Church, who was then suspected, the Process Church, of somehow being involved in the assassination of Bobby Kennedy in 1968 in Los Angeles, right? So there was this, like, you know, because when that happened, the Process said, screw this, we're out of here. And they left uh, Southern California. But they were believed to have something to do maybe with Sirhan Sirhan. Because Sir Han was into this stuff, he liked all the he, he was into hypnosis. He was into uh, different weird religions and occultism and theosophy and Rosicrucianism and all of that. His yeah. notebooks are full of that. If you read them, they're fascinating. So he was he was involved in this kind of thing. Was process involved? And then there was the Manson family. You know, then there were the Manson killings. And there's Manson saying, "Well, I'm I'm Robert de Grimston. You know, I'm 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 who he really is. I'm like the the force behind him." And then eventually the process showed up at prison when he had been arrested and telling Manson, don't, don't say that anymore. And for some reason, Manson obeyed them and agreed and stopped talking about the process. What they did to scare him away from that, I don't know. But they were nervous because they had printed an interview with Charles Manson in their newspaper. The process would give out these newspapers, free newspapers to get people to join their group. And they had articles by all kinds of people. Marianne Faithful had an article in the Process newspaper. And then here's Charlie Manson talking about death and fear, how you have to get the fear. You know, if you get the fear, then you'll be free. You have to understand fear. You have to, you know, sort of wallow in it, understand it, make it your friend, and then you'll be, you'll be okay. So there was a connection between Manson and the Process, obviously. So was there a connection between the Process and the Manson killings? Was there a connection between the process and, and the RFK assassination, right? So all of this stuff was swirling around and the process had to get out of town. And they did. And they were in New York for a while. We saw them. We saw them in New York. They had a, they had a not a townhouse, but they had a, a loft building somewhere downtown. And uh, so that was around, you know, in the late 1960s and the early 70s. So, you know, they were there. Believed to have been involved, perhaps, in the uh, the Son of Sam killings, right? That's how their name came up again, was were they involved in the Son of Sam killings? And there were people who made that connection right away between the process and the killings. Um, David Berkowitz at one point kind of implicated, you know, implicated them, said that they were, then he took it back and just like Manson took it back, you know, so there was this idea that there was something deeper going. Um, eventually de Grimston cut off his relationship with with the process, uh, his wife and he split up. Marianne McLean uh, kept it going for a while. It's kind of a Christian animal rescue operation out in the West somewhere. In Utah. Uh, excuse me? In Utah? Utah? Yeah. Oh, there you go. And then um, de Grimston went to the New York City area. I believe he was in Staten Island for a while and he was teaching at a local university or something, trying to keep a low profile. So they kind of fell, the whole group kind of fell apart. But they were in Mexico for a while. They. They were doing all kinds of things. They were suspected of much more than they actually did, most likely. But this emphasis on the black robes and the German shepherds and the worshiping of Satan, and then, you know, the son of Sam killings, where there's dogs and Satan, and et cetera, et cetera. 
it seemed like there was a connection. Maury Terry believed there was a connection uh, between the process and the Sam killings. We, we who lived that. there at the time, we were convinced that the Sam killings were not done by one person. We were convinced that there was a cult connection behind it through rumors that we heard because I was very involved with the, the Warlock shop and Magical Child at the time. Um, so everybody who was anybody came in and out of those stores. So we heard a lot of stuff, you know, so the, the idea was we were pretty well satisfied there was a group behind it and that Berkowitz was not acting alone. Uh, there were more people involved, especially there were there were witnesses to some of the killings. Nothing added up with Berkowitz. There was a couple involved in at least one or two of them, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been in contact with one or two of the survivors as well. They also believe that there was more to it than uh, than David Berkowitz. But, you know, at this point, I don't know if we'll ever definitively find out. Actually, there are police officers that believe Berkowitz. Sure. In that I've talked to them. Yeah. Actually opened up an investigation. Mm -hmm. You and I have talked about the Maury Terry book, Ultimate Evil, where Terry links uh, Berkowitz to a satanic sect. And also, he implies that the process church was uh, was enmeshed in there too. Um, and I think his research is very solid. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought so too. When I read Ultimate Evil, also because of my background, I was able to relate to individuals, personalities, places. I mean, Maury Terry actually refers to the Magical Child Warlock Shop bookstores without, without naming them, but just giving their locations. I mean, I don't know why he didn't go. I guess he was afraid of getting sued. But we knew, I mean, reading Maury Terry's book was reading, you know, uh, it, it was not so much a revelation as a confirmation of a lot of the things that we knew that were going on at the time that no one had bothered to put in the book form before. But um, I don't say that 100% of, of Ultimate Evil is, is you can go to the bank on. I think a lot of it, some of it, Terry was imaginative. He was speculating in, in places, but the speculation was warranted because of what he had come across. So I can understand that. Um, I wrote my own index for the Ultimate Evil because there's no index to that book. And I needed an index to keep finding the names and to relate it to other things I was doing in Sinister Forces when I was writing Sinister Forces. I needed to go back to Maury Terry. He was he was somebody who was who knew where other people had been at specific times. And that's the information that I needed. But yeah, there remember Berkowitz went to the same high school I did. I graduated in 68. Berkowitz uh, started going there in 1969. He also came from the Co-op City area, era, uh, area, uh, and that's where I was involved with with you know cultic stuff that was happening at that time. We knew people in common, you know. I knew some of Berkowitz's friends, and, and they were part of a group around us. There was a lot of occultism in that part of the Bronx in those days, 68, 69, 70, where Co-op City would go up. The biggest Build the biggest housing construction project in, in the nation's history at the time was Co-op City. And where it was built was was wilderness, was was hills and 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 water and trees and forests and everything else. It was a great place for groups that would go out there and conduct occult ceremonies. So we just knew this was the crossover period. This was where all of this was taking place. And when we heard there were people in Pelham Bay, which is where Co-op City is located, Pelham Bay Park in that area. And then just north of that in Westchester County, it all fit together for us because we knew there was a lot of traffic between Westchester County and Pelham Bay where the cult stuff was going on. And also in Meyer Park, too. Yeah, that was in the in Yonkers on the other side. Yeah, but yeah, still. So sure. do you believe that uh, the Process Church was the fountainhead for the cult that ultimately became known as the I don't believe the Process Church per se, I believe a, a group within the process church was. I think there were people at process who were kind of bored and dissatisfied with the kind of slow pace of things. They wanted things to be a bit more energetic, a bit more in your face. There were those who were attracted to the satanic aspect of it, who wanted to see more of that and less of the Jehovah you know, aspect. They wanted the Lucifer Satan thing. And so they, they were, I think they were more motivated to get involved in more dramatic cult rituals and, and also there was possible drug connection that was going on there as well there was um there was also a connection to uh some of the 
the S and M gay bars in Lower Manhattan at the time, also, which was kind of a mafia connection. There was an organized crime element with pornography, um, the S and M bars, drugs, etc. So there was this this milieu that they were operating within, where somebody could be in the process but also be part of this milieu and was kind of you know orchestrating their own little cult within a cult. I think that's more like what was probably happening, because there were wealthy people in in uh, Westchester County who were involved, who were not necessarily into the process end of things, but they were just interested in the ceremonial magic, Jack Parsons, Dr. You know, John D. kind of aspect of things more than group rituals with a bunch of you know teenagers or dissatisfied youth. They were more into something a bit more dramatic. Well, I, I think that we should darken an already very dark conversation. Let's talk about the Church of Satan and the Temple of Set. Well, well, there's Church of Satan, there's the Temple of Set, and then there's the Satanic Temple. So which of these you want to go to? Well, the Church of Satan gave birth to the Temple of Set. Right. Less. Now, it is believed that Michael Aquino, who was or Aquino, who was head of the became the head of the Temple of Set, um, thought that the Church of Satan was superficial and he wanted something more hardcore. But then I've also been told that this was a deal that was worked out between LeBay and also Aquino, where Aquino, where they just wanted to broaden their particular Satanism. So the Church of Satan would appeal to people that weren't as hardcore, and then people that wanted to get hardcore would be attracted to the uh, Temple of Set. Have you heard those that innuendo? I don't think it was deliberate. I think that uh, Aquino was more intellectual. I mean, he had a PhD and he was a political scientist. He um, he was very well educated. He was also had a tremendous background in the military. I think he was he saw the the Church of Satan, Anton Levey's group, as being kind of a of a club. You know, uh, Levey was a showman. He was uh, had been in in the circus. You know, had worked at carnivals and stuff. He was that kind of a guy, Levey. He was creating something uh, which was more sort of a almost a libertarian kind of approach to to um, a religion. It was kind of a do what thou wilt or a do what thou want kind of, of an atmosphere there. Uh, it was, you know, personal responsibility and personal expression and that sort of thing. I don't think he was serious necessarily about Satanism, although some of his followers claim that he was, some claim that he wasn't. But uh, Aquino wanted to do something that was a lot more rigorous, intellectually demanding. Um, he wanted to create like a real something that was you could sink your teeth into uh, intellectually. He wanted to create, you know, and his followers have been more or less like that. They've been people who've, you know, written a lot of stuff and they've, they've researched, they've gone to university, they've studied religion, archaeology and that sort of thing. So he's trying, he was trying to create something more along those lines um, and to make it much more respectable as a cult than the Church of Satan, which basically took anybody. You just send in your money and you're a member of Church of Satan. You buy the book, the Satanic Bible, and you're there. You know, uh, There really wasn't much more to it than that. But Aquino wanted a lot more. He wanted to present a lot more, but he wanted to do a lot more. The problem, of course, I have with Aquino is, uh, and he he knew it, uh, was that he, he, he idolized the whole Nazi thing a little bit too much for my taste. Um, conducting rituals at Wavelsberg Castle um, for instance, which is where you know Heinrich Himmler had created his Vatican for the for the SS. I mean, that kind of stuff is like you know why, right? And he did that while he was you know in the service. I mean, he was he was he was a military man. He was a lieutenant colonel. I believe uh, so. That actually, NATO paid for his little ceremonial magic in Himmler's castle. That's what I've been told. I've heard possible. He never said that to me, but you know. I don't know why they would have, but who knows? There's groups within groups within groups that are have their own little fascinations. As in the CIA, you had groups within groups within groups, right? With looking towards, you know, let's let's do let's do MK Ultra, but let's let's crack it up a notch, you know, and see what else we can do with hypnosis and magic and things, and see if we can create things to happen, make things happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's that was the Aquino thing, and then you know, 
And that that group still exists, but he left it actually. He sort of retired from it a few years before his death and left it in other hands. So you have the people who came out of that tend to be a lot more um, well-read, more intellectually oriented, because that's what Aquino demanded of his people than the people from Church of Satan, which was kind of, like I say, a club that almost anybody could join. Um, and they went into all the Baphomet images and the black, you know, symbols and everything else, black candles and and the the, the black mass, you know, whole thing, which was all theater. But let's not forget that one of the people who was filmed as uh, being a member of the black, one of the black mass operations was a member of the Manson family, right? So I think it was Susan. And Atkins, if I'm not mistaken, who was the altar, the nude woman on the altar uh, for the Black Mass for Anton LaVey. So you had that, you know, connection uh, to the Manson family, however inexplicable, but there it was. From what I understand, a lot of people fled the Temple of Set because Aquino had taken it in such a hardcore Nazi direction. Yeah, I mean, I could see that, you know. And and he knows that I you know was diametrically opposed to that, but Aquino, like uh, other friends of ours uh, with similar backgrounds, was one of these people who believed, um, for instance, that uh, Parkland, the Parkland massacre here in Florida a few years ago, not far from where I live, I knew one family that was involved at Parkland had lost a son during the Parkland shooting at the Parkland, at the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School. And I got an email from Aquino after that event saying, but that was all staged, right? That wasn't real. And I'm thinking to myself, this is Michael Aquino, right? This is somebody who has the education, the background, he's been in the military, he's Operation Phoenix in Vietnam. I mean, all of this background, and he can actually sit there and, and say to me that no one was actually killed at Parkland, that it was like a like Alex Jones and Sandy Hook, the same thing, that these were, this was all fake. And I had to write back to him and say, you know, Michael, I live like a mile from there. You know, I mean, I, I knew one of the families. I mean, it, there's no doubt in anybody's mind this was an actual massacre. But here he already was. Here's, here's Aquino with the mindset this, this far right kind of mindset that he had, I mean, doing rituals at Wadelsberg Castle in Germany and talking and writing about Nazis. He wrote a couple of books about, about them, imagining if the Nazis had won or if other things had happened. And he's he's there at the same time doubting Parkland and, and, and uh, Stony Bro um, uh, Sandy Hook and all the rest of it. It's like all part of the same package. And I was amazed at that, you know, I was I was utterly amazed because it's it's like I thought he was at least rational. Maybe he's a, a total Nazi, or maybe he was very right wing, very fascist, whatever. But I mean, you're rational, right, Michael? I mean, you've got I mean, you have the education, the background, and all the rest of it. You've got to know Parkland is not, you know, was not in was not a hoax. You've got to know this, right? No, he actually thought it it was a hoax, and that said to me, oh my God, there there is something really really at root that was wrong there. You know, what's interesting is we have John D, we have Alistair Crowley, and we also have Michael Aquino, and they are all part of various intelligence agencies. Yeah. With the Presidio, and this is uh, something that I believe the Presidio, there was a daycare center at the Presidio right. military base in San Francisco, and five of the children had chlamydia and one of the children um, was with her father and she they just kind of ran into Aquino and, and the girl said like that's Mikey and a bad man. Now, what's interesting and I'll put this on the net too uh, with the article about this particular interview. I have the San Francisco Police Department search warrant and that little girl explains a number of things inside Aquino's house that he's got a cross, an upside down cross on, in the living room that his bathtub has um, uh, lion's feet. Um, there's a number of things. And I 
if that girl wasn't abused in that house, how did she know so many things that were in that house? Well, this is the thing. I, I met Aquino and I was blunt. I asked him about all of this, right? And he knew I was going to. I mean, so there was no, he knew this was going to happen, obviously, because I had written about Aquino before and all the rest of it. And he said, listen, the when the police actually came and investigated, they did not find what she said was there. They jumped to some conclusions, but one room she said was there wasn't there physically. Uh, a couple of other things were wrong. Plus, the major thing was he wasn't even in San Francisco when these things were supposed to have happened. Now, we can say, well, he had took a helicopter from the roof of his house and went, but the military says, no, the military kicked him out when the Presidio thing happened, right? They, they just automatically assume there must be something uh, to it. And then later they were forced to bring him back in uh, and they reinstated his commission because they said, we can't find the evidence for this at all. And they said, if we had, we would have just let him hang out there to dry, but they were forced to bring him back in. How would that little girl know about the bathtub with lion's claws or lion's feet? I mean, how would she know that? But we're, we're jumping from there to pedophilia, and that's a pretty big jump, you know. Remember, he was on TV. I, I do know that. You know, he's been on TV with the eyebrows and the whole thing. He was Mr. Satan, you know, on television, on Geraldo Rivera and all kinds of programs I've seen him on, right? Being interviewed and being very satanic about it. So there was no question that people recognized him for I mean, you can't get, he he had, those were his eyebrows. I mean, this is the funniest thing in the world. I saw baby pictures of Aquino with those eyebrows. I can't believe that he didn't tweak them just to look satanic, but he he walked through life looking like that. Well, here's the thing. This girl who was at a daycare center where five kids had sexually transmitted diseases described things in Aquino's home. And I don't know how she could possibly have known that. I mean, when you have the kids with chlamydia and then you have this girl who's afraid of Aquino and then she describes features in his home, I think that that definitely delineates guilt. I mean, that's what I believe. No, it's possible. There could be other, I mean, according to Aquino, she did not describe anything accurately, but that's Aquino talking to me, so I don't know, right? I've read um, an article on it, written by the San Jose Mercury News. And, right, I saw this that article. And I also have um, the San Francisco Police Department and right. uh, search warrant. So, and they do come together. Uh, so I absolutely believe that Aquino molested those children. And through my very various metaphysical journeys, um, I I lived on a guru's ashram and things like that, but I never really dabbled in magic or any kind of darker fraternities. But um, when I got into writing the Franklin scandal, I didn't understand because uh, there were kids in the Franklin scandal that said that there was ritual abuse, and and there is ritual abuse. Um, if people don't think that ritual abuse exists, which is kind of a popular theme these days, they can, I'll put an article about a guy named Cullen Bailey in the UK who was actually convicted of uh, perpetrating ritual abuse on children. So it, it's not like it doesn't happen. I mean, the false memory syndrome was very effective. But when I was digging into this, I was talking to various people um, in the occult and they told me that there is a strain of the occult that looks upon the defilement of innocence as a sacrament. And what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I have a hard time with this, if only because um, I think I've probably read more ritual magic than anybody else that I know. And on the same time, on the same token, I've met a lot of these, a lot of the individuals. I mean, I've met terrorists, I've met Klansmen, Satanists, 
occultists, the OTO, uh, without number. I mean, I just, I don't find any place, there's no place solid for me to stand on. What is ritual abuse? How does, what does that look like? And for me, I was trying to go through it and saying to myself, well, if I'm going to recognize it, if I'm going to recognize the signs, I've got to figure out what it looks like. What is it? How does it work? How does it happen? You could say conceptually it's about, you know, innocence and stealing innocence. But that's kind of deep and intellectual for a lot of the people we're talking about. And I'm thinking to myself, how does that look? And I wrote I wrote a, a, a trilogy of books, uh, The Lovecraft Code. And the first one uh, is dealing specifically with that. How would it look? What does that look like? How do you use children in an occult context? How has it been done in history? How's, how has it been done forever? You know, and you go across and you go to to rituals all around the world, going back thousands of years. Children's innocence are used as a vehicle for making contact with the other side, because it's believed that children, prepubescent children, have a clearer sight, cleaner image. They are able to communicate more capably, more fluidly with another world, right? You don't rob the innocence from that child. You need that innocence to make that contact. You need to operate through them. But if you're going to, if you have a some sort of demonic presence and they're telling you they demand the innocence of these children, that's like a major freaking thing, right? That's not a casual, let's run some rituals and kill a whole bunch of little kids. No, that's, that's a very serious. Uh, that that That's another level completely entirely. So it's hard for me to imagine any cult would last for any length of time doing this as a standard part of their practice. It couldn't happen. It couldn't happen logistically, but it also couldn't happen because it doesn't make sense. Every time I've seen children used in ritual, uh, and whether you agree with the, the process or not of using them, it is still always to preserve that innocence. There is one exception, and I, I bring this out in my books as well. And I talk about it. If people want to know how these things work, this is pretty much how it works. There was a, um, a, a, a husband and wife Wiccan couple um, years and years ago, back in the 70s. And they wrote a book called, I think it's called The Witch's Bible. I have a copy of it here. And it was a scandal. I mean, it was a total scandal. They were banned from any kind of Wiccan operations, any kind of meetings or anything else because of this book. And the reason was that there was a ritual in the book in which you would initiate your child into the craft using a sexual device. So you had basically uh, carved phalluses that would be used to you know, penetrate uh, a young girl and bring her into this knowledge of, you know, God knows what, but it was part of their 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 pagan practice, according to them. Oh my God, the the storm that erupted over that was enormous, and it it, it tells you two things: one, that somebody came up with this sick idea, um, but it also shows you the backlash was tremendous. Nobody wanted to be associated with that. They were banned. They were completely disowned and dishonored. They had they were they were isolated completely, ostracized completely, because of this one of this passage in this book about witch witchcraft. They had invented their own witchcraft thing, and this was how they initiated their own children. Right. So the whole thing was like, oh, you know, that was it. That was the end. So that backlash right away tells you number one, this was just is not acceptable. Number two, that nobody could even get it on board. Why you would do that? But that number three, there's always the number three, that there's somebody did think about it and somebody was doing it, or we assume they were doing it because they wrote about it. I mean, that's more or less a confession. So you take all of that on board when you look at ideas about you know, the ritual abuse of children. What does that look like? How does it work? How does it happen? How would you do that? How would you maintain that kind of operation over any length of time? The logistics involved in it and if you're involved in occultism you know that stealing innocence is a one-shot thing once it's gone it's gone right but preserving the innocence 
in order to see into a, a show stone, into a crystal, the way they some of the old rituals have it, to have a young person who's unsullied and pure to stare off into the the crystal and to to record the the spiritual forces they're seeing. That's necess that's important, right? It's an abuse, maybe, in a sense, of using a child this way. But then we do worse things in Catholic school, believing. Um, so, you know, that to me, that to me is the abuse, the, the use of children in ritual. The ritual abuse thing, the pedophilia, is is hard for me to to grasp. Not because I don't think humans are capable of it. Obviously, we have human trafficking on massive scale in this world. We have children being trafficked for for sexual purposes all the time. This is not a mystery to me at all. So, all these accounts of ritual abuse, you think that they're a fiction, even though using the children this way, uh, I'm finding it hard to. To, to get on board. It's, uh, I'm gonna put up an article on my website about Cullen Bally. And he was, he and his wife were actually convicted of ritually abusing children. Is that, could that be a fiction that never happened? Even though a English court found them guilty? I mean, but, but are you leaping from there into this international cabal of satanic pedophiles? I am not talking about an international cabal. But I'm saying, and there was a woman who wrote a book called Hell Minus One, and she had been richly abused by her family. And actually, the police officers who investigated the case used, uh, gave her affidavits and other reports. So what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm not talking, this isn't a QAnon thing. I'm not, right. you know, but, yeah. but I'm saying that it, it exists. And in your your trilogy, Sinister Forces, you seem to imply that there is a cosmic evil. I, is that true? I imply, well, I, I kind of state that there's, that the connection between events, Sinister Forces was very political, right? I mean, it was about politics, it was about government things. Uh, and I, my implication was, and a lot of people found it hard to get was that there's a force at work and it's a, it's a it's a force of nature maybe it's some kind of force um which is unseen but which manifests itself quite often in our political life but it's not uh it's not linear so that you can have somebody writing about the kennedy assassination 50 years before jack kennedy was born and getting all the details right or you can get somebody writing about the the uh, Texas uh, Tower a massacre, uh, the sniper on top of the University of o Texas at Austin shooting people and write that in a novel and get everything right, even the name of the cop who's going to investigate it years before it actually takes place. You can you can see there's there's a force in the world that's that is occult in that it's hidden and that it, it obeys laws that we don't understand, that these things do take place, that there are connections between events, between people, and that conspiracies are not always as I always say about a bunch of guys smoking cigars in the back room, sometimes the conspiracy involves you and me unknowingly because of things that we say or things that we do, uh, either understanding something in the past, predicting something in the future, or actually just being in that nexus between the two. So we can be part of a conspiracy unknowingly um, because of interrelationships that exist. So there's there's Nick and there's Peter. We're both published by the same publishing company. And, you know, we're both doing work in similar areas. And are we causing something to take place of which we are not yet aware? So are things happening that we've caused that we're consciously not aware that we've done, but we are somehow responsible for having done? I guess that's what Sinister Forces was about. If there is this force, this dark cosmic force, hmm. There's got to be a subgenus of humanity that wants to tap into that. Well, that's Lovecraft's whole mythos, right? That's the whole idea behind the Lovecraft mythos is that there's these evil forces and there's humans trying to do it. But this is the problem. You remember the Disney movie um, Fantasia? There's Mickey Mouse as a sorcerer's apprentice, right? He's gotten all the... The, the brooms to start marching around, then he loses control of it completely. You can't control this force unless you're really, really very good. 
And you can't become that really, really very good, but just by killing a bunch of people, that just destroys your ability. You can only become very, very good by going through all of these practices of controlling yourself, your consciousness, not just your physical form, but your consciousness as well, to the point where using something as vile as human sacrifice does not destroy you in the process. You have to be able to control that. And believe I have not met the occultist yet that I think has the ability to control that. But what I'm saying is that there is a there is sub a subgenus of humanity that does practice that darkness. You have not come across it. I have not come across it in an experiential way. But these stories that I hear um, about that type of abuse, I mean, a lot of them could be fictitious, but I don't think all of them are. That's where I'm at. Yeah, I'm just not. I'm, my problem is I don't get enough information about the rituals themselves. They seem to be very specific about the sexual aspects of things, but when it comes to the ritual, suddenly it's all vague. We don't know. You know, it's kind of there was ritual involved. I mean, there's there's no specificity. There's no. I can't. I can't pin it on anything. I can't say this is Mediterranean. I can't say it's it's you know European. It's South American. It's Asian. There's nothing there for me to hang a hat on. I can't identify it because there's not enough detail. But the, the sexual details are specific to the point of, of horror. But the ritual details are, well, there was a, they lit candles or something. I mean, that's just, it's not enough. There was that uh, drug cartel that was uh, sacrificing people in, in northern Mexico. That was the, um, yeah, I remember. So it was there were paleros. So it was palero, uh, Palo Mayombe, and right? They end up sacrificing an American guy. That's why they got the heat put on him. Right. So I mean that does exist. I mean there are dark rituals where people are sacrificed. I mean, I mean that's a perfect example of one. But that's what I mean. It's like these were drug dealers, right? And he thought he was getting his power as a drug dealer from making the, the cauldron and, and that I they use for that, I think that many of them that do perpetrate those type of crimes do think that it's they're getting power from it. That's that's what I believe. I, I agree that it's it's conceivable, but I just as a as a phenomenon, I don't see it yet. I see scattered cases. I don't see but but you're and this guy was not like part of a grand cabal of magicians. He was no, no, but you're not denying categorically doesn't exist no 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 okay number one i've always said human trafficking obviously exists trafficking of children obviously exists uh, enslaving children and killing children exist what i'm saying is i don't see the satanic cabal with the the the, the massacre of children as a, as a as a common theme i just th i think that's hollywood i don't see that as, as something that's I mean, That's, in, in the Franklin case, right. there are three kids that come forward with very specific allegations about ritual abuse. Um, and I've spent a lot of time with two of them. And I don't think that they're lying to me. What was more important, the ritual or the abuse? One of the girls who I, actually I've got all her psychiatric records. I never talked to her. She wasn't willing to talk to me. She called, she was told that these were quote unquote power meetings. And I think, and like that uh, drug cartel in Northern Mexico, there are people out there that think they are deriving power from human sacrifice, whether it's an adult or it's a, a child. Yeah. I, th I think that that's kind of indisputable. But we've come to this point after a couple of hours of talking about the Knights Templar and Freemasons and Scientologists and everything else. And what I'm saying is that does not segue immediately into child sacrifice. No, no. But to connect those two is I problematic. Mean, I, I do believe that Aquino molested some of those, okay. those kids in the Presidio. And, um, and then you've got the ritual abuse that's going on in the Mormon church. I mean, I think that that's definitely, I mean, there was a state commission that looked into it in 
1992 and found that the ritual abuse did, did exist. So, I mean, I do believe that it exists. Although I have nothing to do with QAnon, I don't think the, the Democrats are part of it. <laughs> that's, that's a problem when you, you yeah. say stuff like that. I mean, uh, tend to get lumped in, but uh, no, I'm not, I have nothing to do with QAnon. And actually, whenever I've been interviewed um, and people ask me about QAnon, I say that they're severely misguided people. Peter, it's been great talking to you. I hope you enjoyed it, yeah.